Welcome to episode 19 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 25th of November and I'm Tony. With me this week are Alan and Laura. How are you doing, Al? Yeah, not bad at all. What have you been up to this week? Very recently, I've just joined a new social networking site. Very exclusive social networking <laughs> site. Excellent. There's, uh, there's only three people on it right now. I, there are that many. Social. There are that many people into rubber trousers with the bottom <laughs> cut out, are they? <laughs> no, it's called the Allens. Okay. It's uh, just for people called Alan. Excellent. Who are the other Allens? Well, they're both called Alan, of course. Right, okay. That's about all I've been up to, really. Right, excellent. Well, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, what have you been up to? Would you believe me if I said I joined a social networking site called The Laura's? No. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, quick a, register uh, that domain yeah. right now. Uh, people probably already have. <laughs> what have you been up to, Tony? I upgraded a server at work, our, our Zen, one of our Zen servers, from 704 to 710 during Zen, the week. Zen, as in the... As in the virtualization, virtualization thing. thing yeah. um, and it went very well, apart from the fact that the upgrade removed Zen. <laughs> <laughs> because I think at 704 it was in main, and uh, in 710 it was in universe. And at some point in the upgrade process, it decided I didn't, I don't need that anymore. I'm going to get rid of it. Oh. So I had to then you know, manually kind of get it back in. It was all fine. It all worked out well. But it was the first experience I've had of using the do release upgrade tool. Oh, which did you, work. You don't have much luck with upgrade tools, do you? <laughs> yeah. we, well, this is a perennial problem for you, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Apart from removing the major package that supported all the virtual machines that were on that <laughs> server, it worked quite smoothly because I was using the main uh, repos online, the main ah, repositories, right. not any local repositories. Right. So it worked quite well from that perspective. And one other thing I've done, speaking of work, where I'm working at the moment, the, uh, the boss has just installed Ubuntu on an old laptop and uh, we got the VPN working, remote desktop, virtual box, Loads of funky stuff. He did it all himself. You know, asked for a few tips and hints here and there, but did it all himself. Never seen Ubuntu before, and now he uses it every day as his main surfing machine at home, does his email, VPNs to work, remotely controls wow. machines. It's brilliant. He Excellent. absolutely loves it. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. Do you get paid extra for that? No. No. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> it's part of his community spirit. It is. It's part of my job. Now, you may remember in the last episode, or the episode before that, I was talking about that I'd upgraded my Myth TV box to... Oh, um, not this epic saga okay. again. Uh, yes. It, it, gets, it gets better, yeah. because I remember I was talking about recordings not playing back. Mm. Yeah, that being the small feature that was missing in the upgrade. Yeah. It looks like it's something to do with the, the Lib ATA driver, mm. fact fans out there, uh, the new driver that's in the newer kernels for doing hard disks, and it seems to be too slow, so the... Uh, the playback engine just times out and it's got it's got a something like a two uh, two second timeout and uh, sometimes you'll hit play and it'll just be a few milliseconds within the timeout and sometimes you hit play and it'll be just too slow and it'll it'll stop playing so sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and as far as i can tell it's down to the performance of that new driver in the kernel so i have no idea how to fix it Um, does it work with an older kernel then um, the other stuff breaks on the older kernel, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. So it's it's not that uh, clever. And then the power supply blew up in that block. Yeah, that was impressive. Ubuntu caused your power supply it to did. blow up. It was a big flash and a big bang, and it tripped all the electrics in the house. And it smelt. Even though there's a UPS on it, it still tripped all the electrics in the house. So um, there's now... I, I need to get a new box. <laughs> <laughs> I think so I'm justified. Anybody wanting to send us review boxes? <laughs> oh, yes, please. No, don't send them to Tony. He'll just blow them up and make them not work anymore. No, we'll oh. thoroughly test them. I blame Ubuntu. So what's coming up in the show today? We talk about the blueprints that will be put forward at UDS. We have the news. We discuss upcoming events. And your feedback. Lots of feedback. Lots and lots, lots, lots of, of feedback. feedback. Yeah. Um, now, Dave's not here because his car's broken down. Um, and Simon is still busy with work things. Um, so one of us is going to have to say it, I'm afraid. Sounds like a... Fun-packed? Show. It's not the same, is it? It isn't the same. International purveyors of fine proprietary software Adobe have released the 64-bit version of Flash for Linux. It's only a beta, though. Oh, the Tony will be pleased. Yeah, you love Flash, don't you, though, Tony? Yep, I love the way that you can't go to any website without having Flash to see stupid adverts. But um, now you can because you can put it on your 64-bit machine. Yes. Oh, good. You won't, though, will you? No. Why oh. not? Why, what do you have against Flash? But, uh, I object to the way it's used on hundreds of sites on the web. And I like free software. Sorry if to... that goes against your principles. <laughs> 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 Told me. Handbrake, the popular video conversion tool, is now available with a pretty GUI for Linux. Yay. Excellent. It's GPL, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yes. And apparently it's very popular on the Mac. I've never used it. Have you? Uh, no, no. No. 
Um, there's a binary for Ubuntu though, isn't there? Yeah, and it's all GTK loveliness, so it like, fits in with Gnome Desktop. But apparently it does like queuing up of video conversions and stuff. Sounds like the sort of thing I should play with, really. Yeah, <laughs> given that you are the video guru. And you could come back and review it for us. <laughs> I will do that. No pressure. <laughs> Pinax are holding a competition to show off their Django development platform. They're asking people to submit screencasts showing off the best of Pinax with Amazon gift vouchers as prizes to the winners. Cool. I think they uh, they want to try and show off how great it is and they're going to reuse the screencast in their promotion of what it is. Excellent. And that's at pinaxproject.com. P-I-N-A-X project.com. Yeah. And there's a, there's actually a special website just for the contest. I think it's contests dot pinexproject.com but we'll put a link in the show notes just one month after the release of ubuntu intrepid the first alpha of jaunty has been made available major points to note is the inclusion of mono 2.0 Ooh, some people won't like that and progress towards an arm v7 port and that's for sort of mobile devices and things isn't it yeah certain specific well i don't know you don't have it doesn't have to be a mobile device no. but you know arms typically are they can be embedded things i guess under your TV or you know anything that requires a low power. It's unusual to have the first alpha come out before UDS has taken place, isn't it? Uh, yeah, because usually UDS, you do all the specs and mm. figure out what's going in the next release, but this UDS is a bit later than usual, so I guess they got the jaunty release out early. The final judgment on the Score versus Novell case has been handed down, and Score has to pay up to $2.5 million, although some reports suggest it doesn't have the cash doesn't actually sound like that much money. No, not after all these times. They've probably spent more than that on the legal case. Oh, sure. yeah. Lawyers will be running to the bank. Thanks yeah. very much. Scohort thought they had the copyright. They had the trademark. To the word, to to the the word Unix, Unix and yeah. product. Yeah. And to the Unix code. And they were going to go around and sue people for using it and sue people for using Linux because they thought there was enough of the Unix code in there to make it worthwhile. And we just happened to be lucky that Novell were the people well. who really had the, the copyright. But... It is, you know, if it had been the other way around, if Scale had legitimately had a case, that could have been a huge impact. And are we lucky? Bit of a bit of a rewrite there, <laughs> I think. Well, a rewrite of the code because it was. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. all the all the code that they ever trotted out didn't actually amount to that much code, did it? It just scares me when these big companies have got potentially kind of you know, huge, huge impacts on what we do in the free software community. Large companies like Canonical. Canonical aren't that large yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> Crunchbang Linux, the Ubuntu derivative based around Openbox, has been relaunched with a new website, and very swish it looks too. We interviewed the lead developer of Crunchbang, Phil Newborough, in episode 5, so go and listen to it. Yeah, he's a nice guy, and uh, I, I, I gave um, Crunchbang a try today. You know, it, lo- it looks very nice if you like the minimalist and lean approach. It's good to know he thinks he can still support a small project like this. You know, he, mainly him, isn't it, doing it? Yeah. I'd, I'd love to talk to him about it a bit more, actually, because um, I did notice on the install that I, I did, when I did an app get update after installing it, it went off to get the updates from Medibuntu, enabled by default. Ah. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Well, it's one of those things that I've always got wondering in my mind whether it's a good thing to enable that kind of stuff by default or not. Mm. I'm not bold enough to make a statement either way. <laughs> <laughs> Fans of Linux and genetic conditions can now combine their pastimes by running the Linux version of the folding game Fold It. It was pointed out to me by a guy at work who uh, was talking about the folding at home project and how you know it's useful for doing these protein folding type calculations. And I said to him, "Oh no, you don't want to do that because that consumes vast amounts of CPU time and you know eats up." power and mm. makes your cpu run hot and all this kind of stuff and he said no 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 no, it doesn't it doesn't he showed me this fold it thing which actually makes your brain run at 100 <laughs> percent while you're trying to do these puzzles on the screen manually you actually do them yourself oh wow it's not the computer that does it it has these little 3d graphics on the screen of proteins and it tells you roughly what to do and you bend and fold these proteins on the screen and I found that the CPU on my PC was running at 100% while they were doing it. <laughs> All right. And that then goes off to some central server and yeah, you can and they, discover a cure for something or other. I, I guess so. I got as far as running it, noting it was chewing up my CPU and thought, hmm, maybe not. And fans of manual dependency resolution will be pleased to hear that Fedora 10 has been released, including GNOME 2.24 and KDE 4.1. Really? Tony, did you write that? No, it's Dave. <laughs> It was Manual time. dependency res- Are we still on that bandwagon that RPM is horrible? Yeah. <laughs> is it? You use, you use Red Hat at work, don't you? No. No? I thought you did. No. I oh. use Ubuntu. Oh, excellent. Somebody did a, a comparison, though, and, and apparently apt get on Red Hat is faster than apt get on Ubuntu. Really? Yeah. I, I'd have to find a reference for it. That's. Mm. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Although Yum is still slower. 
Mozilla have announced that Firefox 2 will no longer be supported and security patched from sometime in December. That's pretty quick, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Firefox 3 has only been out, what, four months? Yeah. I think this is one of the reasons why um, it was tricky for Canonical when 804 came out and people said, oh no, why has it got a beta of Firefox 3 in it? Mm. Well, here's a clear reason, because Mozilla end of life uh, Firefox 2, so now Canonical internally have got to manage the security of their version of Firefox. Yeah, and patch it, and yeah. and that's and that's in Dapper. Isn't it's in it? Dapper, so they've got another year to go. Well, that- um, eight months. Bearded community wrangler John O'Bacon has announced the second edition of the Ubuntu Free Culture Showcase, which is the competition to get your works of art on the Ubuntu's released CD. Oh, cool. This is the uh, replacement for the example content, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Now, we did it for the last release, and there was content on the CD, and they're doing it again. This time, they're including photographs and other graphics as an acceptable category. So, come on, people, get creative. Yeah. Let's get some really good stuff on there this time. Are you saying the stuff that was on there last time wasn't good? Is that I what you're re- saying, Laura? I remember there wasn't a huge amount of stuff submitted ah, last time. Okay, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of good photographic entries as there are a lot of people on, who use Linux and are into photography. Yeah. I had an idea for a, a video I'd love to do, but um, I'm rubbish. So. You, need, you need to know someone who's into video. <laughs> yes, I do. Oh, Tony. I don't know whether I'm going to be asked to judge it again. If I do, I presume I am exempt. <laughs> exempt? You make it sound like a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> You're Exem- really helping, aren't you? <laughs> Exempt from having to help Popey with a video. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, Jono, please invite me back so I don't have to help So is it, is it on Jono's blog? Yes, jonobacon.org. The Ubuntu Developers Summit for Jaunty Jackalope is coming up on the 8th to the 12th of December at Google's at Google. Mountain View in California. Yeah, that's right. San Francisco-ish area. Actually, I've never been there, so I think it's somewhere near there. It's somewhere between San Francisco and San Jose. I'm going. Yes, so am I. And so is Dave. Yep. Um, and so is a guest presenter, Dave Schwack Murphy. Oh, oh cool. yes, yes. Who designed our website. So what's going on at this UDS then? The UDS stands for Ubuntu Developer Summit. It's where all the developers get together and figure out what's well preliminary ideas of what's going to be in the next release can anyone go along yeah anyone can turn up if you know you have an interest in developing ubuntu and that's developer in a wider sense in that it's anything to do with the development as opposed to coders yeah it's not necessarily uh coders there's um specifications about translations and uh uh updating the website and improving things that are not necessarily to do with writing code yeah definitely and there's, a, there's a whole community thread as well, isn't there? Yeah, there's a community thread. And, and a mobile uh, thread, a server thread. There's a lot of threads. A lot of threads. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there's also be uh, people there to do with um, user interface design. So what are you two doing there, apart from pimping the podcast? <laughs> yeah, well, and, getting, and getting stuff for the podcast. Yeah, well. we hope to do some interviews. Um, cool. But I'm there mainly to do video stuff, so I will be... Um, videoing lots of content and making it all available the exact details of which will be announced nearer the time when you know what <laughs> they, they are, are. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to what you're going to be videoing like developers and stuff or the whole sessions or that's the plan anyway i'm going to be doing interviews like interviews like i did last time with stick um, on youtube stick on youtube and or another place because they're going to make sure they're available in org format as well and there will be session uh, sessions released as well and um, we've got fosdem in february the 7th and 8th in brussels at the usual place. The usual place. Yeah, I'll meet you at, in Brussels at the usual place. <laughs> well, right. I believe it wasn't going to be the usual place. Yeah, they had some trouble with the venue, I believe. Yeah, I think it's all sorted out now. Cool. Rather scarily, it was interviews we recorded at FOSDEM last year that were in our first ever episode. Really? Oh, my life. Yeah. I know. So we're not quite at a year yet, but oh, we're not all I didn't, that far off. I didn't go last year, did I? And you and, you and Dave did some Dave interviews. Dave and I did some interviews, yeah. Yeah, Bongo and... The Ubuntu Russell's and people. Becky Hogg from and ORG, Hogg, yes. who's stepping down in the new year as head of ORG, the Open Rights Group. Yeah. Is it? I mean, is there anything you know that's happening at FOSDEM? No, there's still a call for papers no. out, although I believe that all the submissions for developer rooms and things have to be in by now, but I should imagine it's going to be the same um, groups, Fedora and Debian and um, Gen2 and people like So are you two going? I think so. Yeah, I hope so, yeah. So it's interesting that I find that a number of people commit to going to FOSDEM without even knowing what's going to happen and who's speaking. It's quite good fun. Well, there is that as well, yeah. Yeah, I'd go along. I always find out a few interesting things while I'm there. It's not the cheapest weekend in the, in the world, but it, it's, it's not it's bad. Good fun. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> yeah, there's beer as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a Korea on a Saturday night. Yeah, it's nice to meet up with people as well. Develop not just the developers, but other you know people you 
maybe talk to online and stuff. And we get to see the incredibly efficient guy who runs the lightning talk <laughs> and gives out boxes of chocolates. And he has a, an alarm does clock. He? he has an alarm clock, yeah, that goes off at a 15 minutes past and he gives out a box of chocolates with a joke to every single a speaker. Pun for every a pun single for speaker every single speaker as they come up. So the Nagios plugins talk, he, he gave it the... They gave the box of chocolates to the speaker with, with saying, and here's a box of 20 plugins for you because they're chocolate and a little. Yeah. All right. It's good. He's great. That didn't happen when I was there. No, I think he's I would, have, I I would have tried to give a lightning talk if, <laughs> if there was free chocolate <laughs> involved. For a box of chocolates. Yeah, absolutely. I think he's done it the last couple of years and he's honing his skills on it. It's Excellent. definitely good. Yeah, yeah, it's worth going, isn't it? It's, how long is it? Two, two days. Two days. But most people turn up on the Friday, don't they? People well, turn a up lot of people yeah. go out on the Friday evening. I mean, last year on the Friday evening, it was a huge, we just packed out a bar in brussels and uh i don't think we drank it dry but it got pretty close the payment system in the, on the friday night is quite interesting isn't it yes yeah. so you give all your money to a man with a beard <laughs> this bloke just walks up and goes give me your money yes and he gives you a sticker and then you get free beer sort of kind of free free beer. Beer. <laughs> yeah free and in inverted commas free as in beard we've mentioned that uds is coming up and at uds there's a big drive to design specifications for what's going to be in the next version of Ubuntu, Jaunty Jackalope 904. And we've picked out a few that um, look vaguely interesting. Yeah, so these are called blueprints. Yeah, blueprints or specs, same thing. Anyone can create a specification, absolutely anyone. Okay. Uh, you, just, you just need a launchpad ID, and uh, I think you go to, is it blueprints.launchpad.net or something like that? And... You can create your own specification, your own blueprint. What sort of things do you have to put into a specification? Well, it needs to be something that you can articulate to a developer and let them understand what you want to achieve. So, But it doesn't, does it have to be deeply technical? Do you have to talk about how you might implement it, or can it just be... Initially not, no. It can, it can start off being fairly high level. Okay, so picking a blueprint um, from the list, the encrypted swap by default one, what's that one about? Well, your swap is um, a chunk of space on disk that's used as an extension of the RAM in your machine. Yeah. Would so that be fair to say? Yeah, you've got the physical RAM in your machine and you've got a bit of disk space that's used to swap stuff out. So say if you've got two gig of RAM in your machine and two gig of swap, you can actually run applications that take up four gig of memory. So. Right, okay. So what's the benefit of encrypting the swap space? Well, that, that swap space could have stuff in it that you wouldn't want someone else to see. So if you're sat at work and you're typing a document off, uh, in office mm. that's got you know, sensitive data, maybe your membership list or something like that, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> names and addresses that you don't want people to, you know, to be able to find. If your machine's running low on memory or under certain circumstances when it's a bit busy, it could possibly write some or all of that data out into the swap okay. on disk. By default, that would be unencrypted. And when that's written to disk, that doesn't get overwritten or cleared? It could do What about when point. you switch me- your machine off? No, in short, it doesn't get cleared. There's nothing that says, right, this swap needs to be cleared out because there's potentially harmful stuff in it. Okay. No, I mean, if you were right, if you were hibernating, it would write the RAM to the swap partition, but there's no guarantee that every bit is going to get overwritten. Well, and, and even then, if you, if you hi- when you do a hibernate uh, or suspend to disk, you're taking a, uh, an absolute copy of pages in RAM that are in use and putting them in the swap. Absolutely. So you're good point, guaranteeing yeah. that whatever's in RAM is on the disk. Yeah. And so someone could come along and you know, steal your laptop, pull the drive out of your machine, put it in another machine and look at the contents of that swap and potentially see your e- data. Even if the original file was encrypted in its home directory space. Yeah, if you had like the encrypted private folder and you put it in there, when it's in memory, it's not encrypted. And then when it's chucked into swap, it's not encrypted. So we're kind of partway there down that road by having an encrypted private folder, and we're partway there by having an encrypted home directory, and we're partway there by having a fully encrypted root file system. But the one thing left is that is that swap partition. It's a really good point because although Dustin Kirkland, who wrote the specification, says that you know good applications should mark the memory that holds sensitive data like passwords as non-swappable. If you are using something like Hibernate. It does go, as you say, it goes straight onto the hard disk anyway. So this specification says it should be um, encrypted by default and as part of the installer should set up that encryption. And as something that you never really access directly anyway, that could be a transparent process, a fairly transparent process. Yeah, and that's, I think that's one of the reasons why it's good to have this go to UDS because that's where people who know stuff, clever people, developers who've worked with Linux kernel and the swapping algorithms and how it does swapping, will know what some of the impacts will be. And that's, that's, what the, that's why this whole spec process is pretty good. It's because someone like me, who doesn't really have a clue about the internals of Linux, can write a spec and say, you know what, 
I'd really like it if I had a three-dimensional desktop as soon as I turn the computer on. And someone might be able to say, no, that's not technically possible. And someone else say, well, yeah, we could if we did this and that. And, you know, so mm. getting, getting a discussion going at UDS is a great yeah. way to start moving these specs forward. So how much more would this spec be developed? Would it be sort of completely filled out at UDS or would it just get ideas that you could then go away and complete it? Yeah, you tend to have multiple discussions. You start off with like a high level discussion of um, what you want to achieve and then whoever is driving the spec goes off and updates the specification with the details, the results of that discussion. And maybe you need to pull in other people because it could be that in that meeting, in that discussion, there weren't necessarily the relevant people. Mm. And so you can network and grab other people from other rooms. And I've, I've seen that happen. You can be sat in a room and someone will say, oh, I know Scott knows all about that. And they'll get up and go into another room and drag someone else in and say, will this work? Can we do this? Will this fit within the guidelines and, and so on? So having all those people in one place is a really great way to get these things thrashed out. But yeah, it will go through an iterative process until the spec is enough that you could give it to a developer and they would know what to do to make that happen one thing that occurs to me in reading it and it's a very short um summary at the moment and this isn't a dig at this particular spec but based on john o's call today i think it was on his blog about getting more interaction design into ubuntu i'd have thought this was the place to start doing that getting that how this will actually be used rather than starting at the very technical level how would you see that that could be improved taking it from a user point of view how will this affect their user experience that's a good point what, and what will they do to enable it disable it i guess that gets fleshed out during those numerous discussions and also afterwards because the whole thing about uds is that's where you first start getting those specs fleshed out and then you know we've got another four months until the next release comes out and there's a lot of time then when it can be tested obviously it's going to go through alpha beta and all that kind yeah of stuff. not so much just the, the testing but actually starting off from that point of view of how it's going to be used well you could take a specification that had a UI change as the central point of it. This is, this is I mean, it's a tricky one because this one is very, you know, ones and zeros. It's a very, it's a very technical it thing. It is, but when we were discussing the swap, the encrypted folder in the last episode, one of the things was how is it actually used? Yeah, and, and it's not exactly straightforward. And yeah. it's not straightforward and getting that information in this level would so, would get that in people's brains before it keeps going. I just wondered whether that's... I mean, this is quite a technical spec, but it does have a user impact. The other thing that looks like it's quite high on the list for UDS is boot speed. There seems to be about four or five <laughs> yeah. different things. Um, looking from a kernel perspective and looking from an art disk input-output perspective and uh, all sorts of different ways to try and get the boot speed quicker. Yeah, I think this was, this was triggered by that uh, news item we mentioned a few weeks ago from Intel from the um, Linux Plumbers conference where Intel showed off a, an EPC booting in five seconds. There was a guy who's taken Debian on his EPC and got that down from a 33-second boot to a 15-second boot. So sure. that's quite a significant saving, mainly just by removing packages and tweaking the odd script here and there. So he's done quite well. He's also done some fairly fundamental changes like make his kernel non-modular, which, for those who don't know, the kernel in Ubuntu and Debian has a load of modules compiled for it so when you plug a device in like if you bought a wireless lan usb device you plug it in the kernel detects it and loads a module which is in effect the driver for that for that device and those are all modules that don't get loaded into memory until the device appears and i think one of the things that he's done is compile everything into the kernel binary because he knows this is going to be on his epc he knows all the hardware in that mm. device so he's going to be a bit stuck if he ever sticks like a 3g dongle in it or something that he hasn't hard compiled the the kernel with that module. And that's great. And what he's done is great to further the knowledge of how to improve boot speed. But what the specification needs to do is address what the impact of that is for all the other packages and all the other parts of Ubuntu. The, yeah. whole, the whole conversation we had about um, KDE developer doing something that breaks something for GNOME or GNOME developer doing something that mm. breaks something for KDE. There needs to be that whole conversation to make sure that everyone's reading from the same hymn sheet and they all know which bits are going to be affected by this change or maybe it needs to be a user-driven thing mm. and the user needs to decide i would like fast boot up you know really old pcs used to have a turbo button yeah. which <laughs> you know you press that and you get 10 megahertz or you don't press it and you get 4.7 maybe we should have a button in ubuntu which rejigs all the packages on your system and does whatever is necessary to make it boot in five seconds but the caveat is 
you know, whatever whatever the impact of that is. You, you can't, can't plug a USB dongle in. Yeah, it. <laughs> you can't plug any new hardware in after that. And if you did want to, you have to press the button again, which undoes everything and puts it back to how it was or something, something that's easily repeatable on any piece of hardware, that kind mm. of thing. I should write a spec for that. That would be really cool. Turbo button. Alan's special <laughs> button. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's one here, power capping technologies, brackets, green computing. It says dynamic power capping technologies have recently emerged on several vendors' hardware platforms, including IBM and HP. User space utilities are able to leverage BIOS and CPU technologies to cap power usages. This blueprint suggests that Ubuntu should package the relevant open source utilities and configure to sensible defaults. Um, yeah, at Lug Radio Live um, last year, I think it was, um, Matt Garrett was talking about um, how it's best to really blast everything at once and then idle rather yes. than constantly be running at a medium rate. He's blogged that just in the last couple of days. Okay, yeah. There's been a conversation with him and a guy who's doing a KDE tool called, tool called Power Devil or something. Uh, okay. And he, he was saying that, it, yeah, exactly. You, need to, you should run the CPU full tilt, get the job done that you want to get done and then get down into what they call C3 or whatever it's called, this sleepy state so it's using less power some of the other things that seem to be on the uh, spec list that might get discussed at uds are um, changes to the codec installer uh, the automatic codec installer whether that should be changed to the same package kit based thing that debian and uh, other things are using Um, requests to make more applications aware of network changes so that they will disconnect when the network disconnects go into an offline mode and then start up again so that's more integration with um, network manager so you might force say thunderbird to go into an offline mode through reading your email and then they automatically start figure it out up. themselves don't they yeah yeah and i know life rear or life area um, will note when you go offline and, and stop updating right. the sources and things um, and the, other, the final one that caught my eye was improvements to the craft remover, which we talked about in the last episode, um, integrating that with Update Manager so that you can have an option to remove craft when you're doing an update. Oh, okay. Well, when you're doing a, an upgrade from one release to another or something uh, like that? Well, I, I think you know, during the release cycle. Oh, so okay. if you've got back ports or whatever or security fixes you're applying. Okay, so you could have a button that says install updates and another button that says get rid of rubbish. Yeah, so it identifies sort of obsolete packages or anything like that and removes them. One that looks like fun is um, to provide an easy-to-use Xander interface for MIDs or mobile internet devices. Xander? What the hell's Xander? Xander? X-Rander? Oh, XR&R. Uh, it's, that's, oh, the, that's the resolution-changing <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not the most intuitive name thing. What does um, it stand for? X, X rotate, rotate and... And resolution or something? Yeah, rotate, Could be. Yeah. Resolution and rotate or something. Yeah, it says many of these type of devices are small enough that they're regularly rotated in users' hands. Um, some are sold with the expectation of being used in portrait, other with, others with being used in landscape mode. And there should be a simple interface to switch between these modes. Absolutely right. My, my laptop is a, is a um, tablet, mm. and you're supposed to be able to rotate that. And in, in, in Windows... Well, not in Windows, but there is a hardware button that has a little picture of an arrow, and you press it, and it, it's supposed to rotate the screen. And under yeah. Windows, you press it, and it does. And under Linux, it does nothing because of various reasons. But <laughs> you can make it work. And things like on iPhones where you just turn it, and it yeah. automatically changes. Yeah. But that's, I mean, I think the iPhone is the only one that's really got that nailed down nice and sweet with the accelerometer that, that figures mm. it out because my phone is a Nokia in it. It looks rubbish when you rotate it. It takes ages and it's really slow. So yeah, anything that makes that whole rotating on a on a device more smooth mm. is great. Most importantly, there is one that's just called Plymouth, which I think is actually a proposal to move all Ubuntu developers to live in <laughs> Plymouth <laughs> and uh, force them to work there. No, it's apparently ah. Plymouth is the graphical splash thing. Yes. Fedora. It's better in some ways. Yeah, apparently it's more configurable, works better on various video cards, and right. it's just generally people who install it tend to love it better than you splash. Splash screen. Yeah, you know, when you first boot up and you get, the, <laughs> it's got a horrible name. When you first boot up and you see the grub menu, and then that disappears, yeah. and then you see the Ubuntu logo, and the thing underneath it, which they affectionately call a throbber, <laughs> when the thing goes the back. That, the thing that looks like Knight Rider. The yeah, the thing that, that bounces right. backwards and oh, forwards yeah. is called yeah. the throbber, and that bounces back. And th- that software that makes that happen is, is you splash. I'm installing Ubuntu, Michael. And people get excited about that? Well, not that one, clearly, because they want to replace it's it with <laughs> Plymouth. <laughs> it's a throbber, what can you say? <laughs> We got quite a lot of feedback from the last episode, uh, starting with one from the internet's Ken Fallon. 
he says, hi, lads and Laura, and then goes on to detail some commands that he uses that I'm not going to read out because every time I try to, I just stumble <laughs> over myself. So it just turns into a mess. But suffice to say that he uses dpackage and aptitude to uh, take a, an, a basically a list of what packages he's got on one machine mm. in order to build another one with the same packages installed. Yeah, lots of people seem to use that approach. And I can understand that it's quite simple in that you know, you essentially shift a text file from one machine to another and bang, you've got the same software installed. Yeah. But I kind of look at a reinstall as an opportunity, even if it's on a new piece of hardware, to kind of get Pair rid of things down. that I'm not using Some anymore. Craft. Yeah. yeah, development libraries or you know, random other things I've installed for something. He also says uh, he usually installs uh, TrueCrypt so that he can share an encrypted USB keys between different operating systems because okay. TrueCrypt's cross-platform. Okay, so Windows, Mac? Yeah. Yeah, basically you can stick stuff on a TrueCrypt volume on a USB stick and then take it to another machine. Finally, Ken also says he keeps his old home directory so that an update is very boring and everything looks and works just the same. Yeah, see, that does annoy me because one of the things I don't like about doing an upgrade in situ is that settings are retained between the, the, the what, pre like your desktop upgrade. Yeah, and applications. application settings and things. So sometimes there's some that problem? funky... Well, sometimes there's funkiness that you don't get oh, because your yeah. settings are maintained and it's turned oh, off in yeah. those settings or it defaults to off or whatever. Whereas if you've done a fresh install or you create a new user account, you get the funkiness. Maybe that's why I didn't find Intrepid that exciting because I just kept my same home directory. Well, Matthew Cucuzella... I think I pronounced that correctly, has written in saying that when he installs a new Ubuntu release, he likes to format the drive and, and do a fresh install because it gets rid of all the software he installed and tried out right. but just didn't use and forgot about. Um, he's got a simple bash script he created called apt-get, which might ring some bells with people. <laughs> Ab- Ab- apt-get. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Sounds familiar. Yeah. And uh, basically he uses that bash script as a wrapper around the other apt-get. Um, <laughs> This sounds like a great plan. It can't go wrong. <laughs> and essentially, it, it logs a list of packages he's installing to a file so that he can then remove them all later. Oh, uh, okay. That, I think that's one of the flaws that people have mentioned about apt-get. It doesn't, it doesn't have a log of what it's done. Yeah, it's a good idea. It'd be useful to see it implemented in apt-get rather than as a wrapper. Michael Fletcher, who apparently met Popey at a release party. He did, but I don't... Well, I do remember someone coming up to me, but there's just this big blur of people. You just use them and lose them, don't you? Yeah. Well, Part of being a celebrity, beer. Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't realised, sorry. <laughs> he says that after an installation, he normally adds the Medibuntu repositories and then installs GStreamer codecs, good, bad and ugly, Google Earth, Skype and any other programs required. Required. Google Earth required. Must, have Earth. <laughs> must must be able to zoom into holiday destinations and, <laughs> and see people sunbathing. And look at his house from a book. Yes. Um, he also gets Real Player, Flash, VLC, and Acrobat Reader. Adds the Real Player, did he say? Mm. Interesting. I don't remember the last time I installed Real Player. No. I, I actually, I recall Matt Lee having a go at me on IRC about two years ago because someone came into the ubuntu irc channel and asked how do i install real player on my machine and i said well you just click here to real.com slash linux because at the time it wasn't in the repository he said what are you doing telling people to install non-free software tell them to install m player and actually i have to thank matt because once i figured out that m player will play all that real player rubbish like the stuff that's on the bbc website or was on the bbc website yeah without the adverts i stopped using real player so thank you matt lee anyway back to michael fletcher he adds the wine repository and virtual box repository he says he st- tends to stick with repositories because he feels more comfortable mm. with them it means that any updating is managed through the update manager and done in one step so he adds a whole load of repositories and then installs a load of stuff yeah mostly non-free stuff by the yeah. sound of it although yeah. interestingly the virtual box the open source edition is in universe now anyway yeah um, although if you need the USB support, you have to have the non-free version. The non-free version. Um, yeah, they are all non-free things pretty much, but that's probably just because they're not in the Ubuntu repositories. Yeah, so. that's true. I've got a lot of sympathy for people who install things like VLC because it's a codec patent issue. Well, you don't have sympathy for people who install real Flash. Players. Or Google Earth. Or Google Earth or, Earth or Skype or anything. <laughs> <laughs> or Flash. Tom Norbeck says that after installing Ubuntu, he runs a command to remove all the mono-dependent applications. F-spot oh, and all the Tom mono Bye. libraries. And... As well as the mono libraries, yeah. And then he fills the application void with two excellent packages. Packages, Zim for notes and Gthumb for photo organizing. <laughs> I have to say, Gthumb is not a patch on Xbox. No. Gthumb is not a photo organizer no. in any respect whatsoever. But you know, even if there was 
uh, a GTK native equivalent of, of Xbox. Xbox yeah. um, what's the big issue with mono? I, uh, I hear there's a about lot. It. People are still going on about it. And people are really quite, you know, stressed about having mono in Ubuntu by default because Ubuntu has a number of GNOME apps, like you mentioned, Tomboy and F-Spot. Mm. And then there's GNOME Do as well, and there's a few other things. And some people really get their knickers in a bunch about mono. I just don't get it. What's mono for anybody who doesn't know? Mono is a Linux implementation of the .NET framework runtime stuff. And is that why people don't like it? Y- yes, because it's mainly a Windows technology. And also there's a worry that Microsoft have got bits of it patented, and they could come along after uh. people have built all this infrastructure around mono and go, aha, this is all patented now. You can't use it and we're going to take away half the Linux desktop and you have to spend another four years rewriting it all in GTK or whatever it might so-called be. So-called submarine patents. Mm. Uh, well, I quite like Left <laughs> Spot and Tomboy. Yeah, I, I like them as in fact, well. I use Tomboy I mean, a lot. If that ever did happen, if Microsoft ever did say, we've got these patents and they're in Mono because they're in .NET and you've re-implemented .NET as Mono and all these applications that depend on Mono, you're going to have to scrap them or pay us a monstrous license fee, which none of the mm. Linux distros are going to do, then, well, I, I can't see it happening. Okay, they're not the most friendly company to open source in the world. That's putting it mildly. Yet Mono's been around for long enough that if they were going to have a go at it, you think they would have done it by Yeah, now. but the counter-argument to that is yeah, they can do it any time they like. If, yeah. they, if, they, if they want to wait until it builds up to be a dependent part of the GNOME desktop and then say, ha-ha. I mean, having looked at Zim, it looks okay, actually, in terms of features. It looks roughly like Tomboy does, which is, which is quite good. At least there are some alternatives out there. There's alternatives for everything that you've, you've got in Mono, but it's whether yeah. you're willing to... Vi. <laughs> it's whether you're willing to, you know, take that approach of throwing away in effect all the mono stuff yeah what are your views on, on the whole mono thing because we're kind of we don't understand what the fuss is about let us know podcast at ubuntu-uk.org following on from the what do you do after you've installed uh, josh holland has emailed in to say that he installed 810 on his dad's computer last week and he used alan's blog entry for his first commands um, he's converted his dad over to free software as a result so thanks alan for your helpful blog posts and to the rest of you lot for a brilliant podcast. When sure. will you eventually manage to get them out there? I don't, Ooh, I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, you put them out on time, you lot must not download them on time. So, so what, was in your, what was in your blog post? Basically, one of the packages that I install is in the repository, in the universe repository. It's called Ubuntu Restricted Extras. And I think we also had a question from Andy Piper asking what the name of that package was. And yeah, uh, yeah it's Ubuntu dash restricted dash extras. And it's a, it's called a meta package and it pulls in a load of other stuff. Some of it non-free like flash and um, also pulls in Java and a load of other stuff. And some of the G streamer stuff and codecs and all that kind of stuff makes it nice and easy to um, mm. you know, be able to play back stuff. Keir Thomas, who wrote the Ubuntu Kung Fu book that we reviewed in the last episode, emailed in having listened to our review and uh, it wasn't full of flaming and abuse, so that was, that was always good. Well, our review or his email? <laughs> his, his, or his both, email. thankfully. He said he listened to the podcast and um, he thought it was great. He said it was even funny, which is always good. Um, Unfortunately, it won't be this week because Dave's not here. Yeah, <laughs> we'll have to do, make do without him. And uh, he said it was good uh, and nice and entertaining and not just some American guy droning on and on and saying, er, and um a lot. I, I don't know what he means by that. I nope. can't think of any podcast that do that. Nope. And he reminded him of Steve Wright in the afternoon, uh, but without the music and without Steve Wright, obviously. He said maybe we can do a factoid section like Steve does. For the record, he says the tips in the book that we sort of said they're all higgledy piggledy. Yeah, we said they're all spread out all over the place, yeah. Uh, And they're not in any particular order in terms of how hard they are either. He says they're meant to be all mashed up. The intention was to make the book fun and to get away from rigid computer books where everything is regimented. I think he did that. I think he did that pretty well, actually. Yeah. It's not It's not like a, an O'Reilly book where, you know, you have a chapter on this and a chapter on that. It's pretty, you know, oh, you yeah, can dip yeah. in any time, couldn't you? But you still have to work your way through in order not to miss something good. That's the downside. Yeah, it's finding the stuff, I think, that was the... Yeah. Anyway. yeah That's the swings and yeah. roundabouts, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Really? He think, he says, however, he thinks they might not have emphasised it enough, um, or maybe it was just a bad decision. Well, we don't think it was a bad no, decision. No, I don't think it was, it was a just, bad decision. Just the way just it turned out. a bit out. different. Um, yeah. He thought our verdicts were fair, which is always good, and he's added a link to the podcast on his blog, which also syndicates on the Amazon.com page for the book. Oh, blimey. And speaking of his book, because the podcast was a little late arriving in your mm. podcatcher's uh, last week was it yesterday it came out or <laughs> it seems like it yes we've decided to extend the competition because we ended it you know pretty soon after i think the, the episode came out on the day the competition was due to end 
<laughs> it doesn't really give people much chance. Although we have to be fair, people do still email us with competition answers from past episodes. Yeah. So we've extended it until the... 3rd of December. 3rd of December. Get your competition question in. No. Get so, the answer in. Well, that would be better, really, wouldn't it? You could send us a question, but it won't do you much good. Um, the question was... How many tips are there in the book exactly? And send the answer to competition at ubuntu-uk.org. Um, Sam left us a comment on the blog saying that he, he had had some problems with his upgrade. Um, he ran the update, spent about five seconds downloading the updates, followed by an hour working out which programs it should remove. Crust. That's fast. Five seconds to download the updates. Yeah, yeah. something's not quite right there. <laughs> so, yeah, that rings yeah. alarm bells straight away. I think that's not quite good. It worked out which programs it should remove and deleted them. It then rebooted without installing the new kernel, but having review, removed a few useful programs like Firefox, Pigeon, Network Manager, and Devolution. That's just cruft. That it sounds is. like he might be installing Nubuntu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crash back, crunch bang, or maybe Debian. Apparently a number of other people on the forums had the same problem, um, but he managed to copy his home folder and then install Intrepid from CD, and everything's been fairly smooth since then. I think that's one lesson I learned fairly recently, is if anything goes wrong, don't reboot. You might be able to monkey around and copy things over a network on and get the necessary binaries to fix the thing up it's difficult when you haven't got another system to try it out on first it is all your eggs in one basket if you're a home user yeah. Do you know what would be really nice is if update manager had a test upgrade thing so it could Ooh. do a, like a so the only reason why i'm thinking this is because there's a proprietary system that i work on during the day and it has pretty much this feature where you can do like a test upgrade and it it tries to do as much of the upgrade as it can and then tells you whether it's going to work we've had some more feedback about the viglan mpc little boxes that we loads reviewed. of people have bought them yeah episode 11 can you believe we uh reviewed so that long ago episode. it was all that, all that time ago but they've kept on being popular and we kept on having feedback about them as well and the really offer's good. still going yeah the offer is still going go and download episode 11 and have a listen to that if you're interested in getting this viglan box for 79 pounds with a usb stick and a keyboard and a mouse and all the bits and bobs and with pre-installed with ubuntu pre-installed with and zubuntu oh yes zubuntu and that runs till the end of this year but andy piper from farnborough in hampshire has emailed in saying he listened to the npc episode a while ago and so he could get himself one of these and ended up with two i'm not quite sure how that happened that must have been a slip of the mouse or something um he spent a few days reacquainting himself with debian and ubuntu having been a long-term red hat and fedora user um, we're and getting a lot of those mails aren't we people coming from fedora yeah he'd upgraded his npc from 8.4 to 810 with help from me apparently <laughs> and oh. uh alan and andy's sanford clark's guides on how to do it so these were blog posts presumably yeah um and he's going to replace his old p3 server with it with a uh, basically runs a current cost an imap server and apache and cuts down his power usage and noise by putting it all on the vog- on the viglin we should um aggregate yours mine and andy's stuff onto the ubuntu wiki about the viglin yeah because there's already pages on the wiki about specific hardware like the acer aspire one and the triple epc long time listener and friend of the show andy stanford clark just wanted to let you know what i'm using my viglan mpc for i've moved my entire home automation system from the pile of equipment shown in the first photo attached to this email to a sec- single viglan with a load of usb serial connections in the second photo the pile of equipment he replaced is a cisco wireless access point an ibm thinkpad a linksys slug an archon viper and an archon field sentry io box Moving to the Viglan and turning off all that lot has replaced 50 watts of always-on standby power with 10 watts. So that's 40 watts less, or about £40 pounds a year. That's pretty good going. So that means the Viglan's kind of paid for itself in two years. Two years. And he still gets to keep all his other equipment to do something else with. Or eBay it, and if you make a few quid off that... Uh, <gasps> ThinkPad, yeah, everyone wants a ThinkPad. Yeah, he could easily cover the costs. And we'll stick those photos up on the blog post for this episode yeah. when we release it in the show notes, so you can actually see this big mass of, mass of cables. I've got to say, the Viglan one is still a, a bit of a mass of cables. <laughs> <laughs> it's just less bits it's attached to. Fewer bits. It's a shame the photo doesn't convey <laughs> how much less power is being drawn by that device. Crazy Dane Jenna Shenzgard says, Thanks, you rock! I can't keep that <laughs> voice up. <laughs> Hi, Ubuntu UK podcast crew. Thanks a lot for a great show. I like your style. Your sense of balancing geeky stuff with stupid questions for the average user. Do we do that? Do we do stupid questions? 
No, qu- no, no question, question is stupid. There are quite <laughs> a lot of stupid answers oh, there. Of course. <laughs> and I like the length of the interviews and talks and the community spirit and your sense of humour. See, it's the humour thing again. It is. We're just your Ubuntu clowns. That's what we are. <laughs> Um, Simon Vetz, who is a Brit in Australia, says, Hi, I'm a Brit living in Australia and loving it. (laughs) But I always listen to your great podcasts on my iPod. They're relaxing and interesting. I really like Ubuntu and OpenOffice and the thought that I'm not making anyone at Microsoft any richer. I wish you could tell me a way I could use iTunes on Ubuntu or some program to replace it. It's it's the only reason I still use Windows Vista. What do you use? You've got an iPod, haven't you? I've got an iPod Nano, but only because it was a gift. <laughs> he said hastily, yeah. Quick, he thinks the lady doth that. protest too much. Right, and what software do you use to manage the music on your iPod? GTK Pod, if I want to manage the iPod stuff, or I just use Rockbox, which I just copy files straight onto the mass storage. And the nice thing about Banshee is when you drag music onto the device, it transcodes it to the right format for the device. So you don't have to monkey about with the firmware on the device. You just So if you had OG files... You could just drag them onto it and it, it converts them into MP3s along the way. What Simon doesn't say is whether his big iTunes repository is AAC, you know, the DRM protected files that he's bought through the iTunes store, mm. or whether it's just random MP3s he's got from uh, somewhere or yeah. ripped, ripped from his own CDs or whatever. Mm. If it's MP3s, then yeah, you can do it on Linux easily enough. If it's the DRM protected stuff, the Apple own format, then it's not really much you can do. Another option is he could run iTunes under VirtualBox. Yes. Because that has USB support if he uses the non-free VirtualBox. <laughs> yeah, but then he's using non-free iTunes, so that's probably yes, less of a worry. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to get a hold of us, you can email us at podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or leave 30 seconds of voicemail on 0845-508-1986. You can follow us on Identica at identity.ca slash UUPC or on Twitter at twitter.com slash UUPC. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us via the hash Ubuntu-UK channel on the Freenode IRC network. Join us on Facebook. Search for the Ubuntu UK podcast. We welcome material, tips, tricks, comments, rants, any kind of feedback you'd like. So please get in touch. Thank you to our mirrors who make it possible for us to bring the show to you, including bitfolk.com and Nefalo and Martin Meredith. The next episode will be uh, recorded at UDS, so we hope to have lots of uh, interviews and chat with uh, cool people. Yeah, we'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.